to you. So we thank and praise you right now. In Jesus' mighty name, amen and amen. 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 If you could turn in your Bibles to Matthew, the 25th chapter, uh, verses 1 through 13. Matthew, the 25th chapter, 1 through 13. And um, on the Bible app, you can get the notes for today's message. Um, And I'm going to ask that you stand real briefly for the reading of the scripture. And then after I've concluded reading, we can have your seats. And I'm reading from the New American Standard Bible. It says, Then the kingdom of heaven will be comparable to ten virgins who took their lamps and went out to meet the bridegroom. Five of them were foolish, and five were prudent. For when the foolish took their lamps, they took no oil with them. But the prudent took oil and flask along with their lamps. Now while the bridegroom was delaying, they all got drowsy and began to sleep. But at midnight there was a shout, Behold the bridegroom, come out to meet him. Then all those virgins rose and trimmed their lamps. The foolish said to the prudent, give us some of your oil for our lamps are going out. But the prudent answered, no, there will not be enough for us and you too. Go instead to the dealers and buy some for yourselves. And while they were going away to make the purchase, the bridegroom came. And those who were ready went in with him to the wedding feast and the door was shut. Later, the other virgins also came saying, Lord, Lord, open up for us. But he answered, truly, I say to you, I do not know you. Be on the alert then, for you do not know the day nor the hour. Amen. You may have your seats. I want to minister to you today from the thought, too little, too late. The danger of running on empty. Our text is taken from the great Olivet Discourse and is a parable about the second coming of Christ. And it is told using the image of a Jewish wedding. And we see that it is told from the viewpoint of ten virgins, bridesmaids, who were part of the wedding party. Now, to understand this parable, I want to first paint a picture of what took place in the Jewish wedding. See, there were three phases to a Jewish wedding. You had the engagement period, you had the betrothal period, and you had the wedding celebration. Now, the engagement period was different from ours. In the Jewish wedding, they were, the marriages were often arranged by the parents of the bride and the groom. So you really didn't have a say-so really in who you were going to marry. When the boy was young, uh, the parents of that boy would begin to look for a girl for him to marry. They would look for a family that they wanted to be related to. Because sometimes, you know, you want to make sure they got some sanity to that family, that they just not crazy. And so they wanted to make sure that, you know, hey, we want to be related to this family. And if that family had a young girl, the two families would come to some sort of an agreement and promise that when their children were old enough that they would get married. It was an official contract between the two fathers who were giving their daughter and their son to each other. And so during this phase, they would return to the father's house. And so they would arrange, they're going to meet, but then now they're going back to their father's house. And as the boy grew, he would learn a trade, most often from his father. So he's going to do whatever his father's doing. If his father's a carpenter, he's going to learn that trade. And when he became good enough, he would begin to work that trade on his own so that he could make a living. So he'd make his own living. And it was his responsibility to be able to provide a place for his wife by building an addition onto his father's house or maybe building his own house, buying a piece of land and cultivating that land where he's going to grow some crops or something. His intent was he needed to be able to show that he could care for her. So one like you're going to marry this lady and you can't provide for her. 
So they had to, he had to learn something. He had to learn a trade. And so by all this time, he would likely be in his late teens or early 20s by now, depending on the house he was building or the trade he was learning. He might even be in his 30s. Now, while all of this was going on, the bride-to-be was preparing herself as well. There wasn't no slack, and she just couldn't get off, and I'm just going to wait for him to come and take care of me. During the years that the groom is learning a trade and building a house, she is learning to become a woman, learning to become a wife and a mother. So she's learning to cook. She's learning to sew. She's learning to do all kinds of stuff. She is sewing her own wedding gown. And she is learning the graces of womanhood. So then we have the next phase, which is the betrothal period. Here the groom would give the bride some money or a valuable object, such as a ring, to seal the covenant vow. So we see how we still do that today. We have the giving of the ring. And so he would do that. And once the price had been paid by the bridegroom, the covenants and the binding promise was signed to record the agreed terms of the betrothal that the groom would provide for the needs of the bride during the one to two year waiting period. So it wasn't like today when we have our wedding ceremony and you go and you have the procession of everybody's coming in and you have the ceremony and you exchange the rings and then you sign the marriage license after the end and then you have the reception. It wasn't like that. It was one to two years where he went back to make sure he finished building the house, that he made sure he had completed his trade and he was ready for his bride. And so he would do that. And so this was the official wedding ceremony that they would take place under the wedding canopy where the couple would come together before family and friends and make their vows. Although the couple was considered married at this point, they did not live together, nor did they engage in sexual relations. Any breaking of a betrothal period was a divorce, and the bride would keep the payment that was made. So if he decided he was going to back out of the deal, she got to keep the ring. So people that say, oh, well, do you give the ring back or do you not? They got to keep the ring. <laughs> if the husband happened to die during that period, the wife was considered a widow even though the marriage had not been physically consummated, nor had they lived together. Although the bride knew to expect her groom after about a year, she didn't know what day or hour her groom might come for her. She, of course, knows that he's coming, but she doesn't know. But she does know that the day is getting closer because, you know, she has her friends who certainly are giving her updates. They're probably going to check out and just make sure he's doing right, going to look and see, and they're like, okay, oh, well, he, oh, he almost got the roof on now, girl. Oh, girl, I saw him bringing some furniture in. Oh, I think you're going to really like that. Or maybe they see him out in the field, and they're working, and they say, oh, girl, I saw him planting some cabbage. Oh, y'all going to eat good. When his trade was learned and his house was finally finished, the last phase would begin, which is what we see in our text today, the wedding celebration. The bridegroom would get his friends together and they would have a parade through town from his house to go and claim his bride from her parents. The bridegroom could show up at any moment and enter the bride's house. But when he chose to come, he always sent a man ahead crying out, Behold, the bridegroom comes, which enabled everyone to prepare for his arrival. Now, you know, that's kind of hard because, you know, ladies, we kind of take a long time to get ready. And all you got to do is hear somebody and now you're supposed to get ready for the wedding. You're supposed to get ready for the celebration at this moment. He would take his bride in a procession, lifted by poles in a carriage through the town, leading to his family's housing complex or the place he had prepared for them to live. This was a time for the entire community to welcome the new couple into society. Can't you see people coming out of their houses, listening, hear the bridegroom come? So they looking, oh, let me see the bridegroom coming. And they're all looking and waiting for him. After the parade through the town, the wedding party would go into the house and they would celebrate for up to seven days. 
Now, y'all talking about a party? That's a party. There would be a night of entertainment and celebration where the bridesmaids would dance with their torches. So this parable is about these 10 torch dancing virgins, these bridesmaids that are part of the wedding celebration. So let's look at the preparation of the bridesmaids, the procrastination of the bridesmaids, and the participation of the bridesmaids. At first sight, there doesn't seem to be a difference between these 10 virgins, these 10 bridesmaids, because they were all called to participate in the wedding celebration. And all of them took their lamps with them to go and meet the bridegroom. So they left wherever they were at when they hear, and they're over there with their, the bride. They're just laying there around, you know, waiting for her, helping her. So they're there. However, we find out that five are wise and five are foolish. The foolish versions just grabbed their lamps and left. And they didn't bring any oil with them. Whereas the wise virgins brought their lamps and they brought an extra little flask of oil. You see, it was the duty of the bridesmaids to be prepared with their lamps ready to rush out to meet the bridegroom. Again, they didn't know what time he was going to come. And so if he decided to come at night, they needed to be ready to be able to light the way. And they had something to do at the wedding as well at the, at the celebration. So the bridesmaids didn't know when he was going to come, but they were to be ready. The uncertainty was considered to be a part of the excitement of the wedding. This, of course, is foreign in our culture today because, you know, we announce weddings for a particular time in a place. And, um, you know, if things are getting late started, people in the, you know, that you've invited, they start looking at each other like, is it going to be a wedding today? Did somebody get cold feet? What's going on? So we start asking questions and we start fidgeting. But these 10 virgins are not Christians living during the church age, but are those living during the seven year tribulation period that the bride and the bridegroom is Christ. Now, you might see, okay, we read this passage, but you're like, I don't see the bride. Why is the bride mentioned? Well, the bride is the church and the church is already gone. So the church is not here. So the bride is not here in this sense, in this situation. So when Christ, the bridegroom returns, it will be totally unexpected. It's unexpected because so much time has passed. How many of you heard growing up, the Lord's going to return, the Lord's going to return. And you're like, well, he ain't came yet. So you're thinking like, okay, well, he ain't going to come. It's going to be 20 years. It's going to be this. People try to analyze and try to figure out when it's going to be. But nobody knows. They don't know. It will come at a surprising hour at midnight, the hour when sleep is most desired and unlikely to be disturbed. You know, if your phone rings at midnight, you're like, okay, what happened? You're automatically thinking something happens. What's going on? Are my kids okay? What, what's going on? So you don't expect your phone to ring because that's the time of rest. It was at midnight that the firstborn of Egypt were destroyed and Israel was delivered. Although Christ tarries, he will come. Though it seems slow, it is sure. Christ has delayed his coming longer than many thought he would. Possibly because God is long-suffering is not, and is not willing that any should perish. 2 Peter 3 and 9. Or maybe he's trying to test the faith and patience of his people. Are you really with me? What are you doing? How many of you have ever thought the Lord, uh, you know, you sought the Lord for something and you, you know, you try to wait patiently. I said try because sometimes we don't really wait. We start trying to figure things out ourselves and try to come up with a plan. You know, I'm going to help you out, God, because you're not moving fast enough. And, you, and he's like, so he seems to be delaying. But then you realize that, you know, he comes in right on time. He comes at midnight. The Bible tells us that Christ is coming as a thief in the night. And when he comes, the shout will awaken, shock, and disturb. The sound will demand obedience, for the bridegroom cometh. Now, both the wise and the foolish bridesmaids grew careless and seemed to have stopped looking for the bridegroom. Girl, he ain't came yet, so what's going on? I guess he ain't coming now. 
And so then they, you know, you know, y'all, sometimes you're waiting and you're waiting and nothing's happening. So you get a little head start nodding and bobbing. You're like, okay, you're nodding. The next thing you know, you just lay down and you just go to sleep. And that's exactly what they did. They started nodding their head. They slumbered and then they slept. So a distinction is made here. The word slumbered means nodded or became drowsy. While the word slept is the word for laying down to sleep. Many Christians have become like the virgins. They have become weary and tired and have fallen into inactivity. They've gone to sleep. Too many Christians have gone to sleep on the job. We are to be awake and watchful. So then we see the procrastination. So when the cry came, behold, the bridegroom comes, the sleeping attendants were awakened and rose to light their lamps. They all had lamps. They were all able to light them. But the foolish virgins realized that they had forgotten something important. They had forgotten to bring extra oil. It was too little, too late. Oil in the Bible is a symbol of the Holy Spirit. And in this instance, the oil represents the Spirit of God by which one maintains their testimony. If you don't have the Spirit of God, how are you going to live this life? How are you going to have your testimony when things come up against you? Are you going to cave in? The wise represent those who have found a deeper level of faith in God. They have an extra vessel of oil. The foolish virgins are those who have a superficial faith and lack a deeper level of commitment. The foolish are unprepared, and as a result, when the final three and a half years of the tribulation begins, they fail to stand up for Christ because they give in to the pressure of what's going on in their society. They give in to the temptations, and so they just give in. What? They kind of like, you know, Peter denied Christ. They're going to be like that, you know, Christ, oh, my goodness, I can't, I can't take this. What? What, what are you going to do? If it became illegal to be a Christian in the U.S., what would you do? Would you still stand for Christ? Or would you be like, no, uh -uh, I'm, on, I'm, on the, I'm on the devil's side. You know, I don't want y'all to kill me for being for Christ. They are not prepared to meet the demands that life throws their way. The word foolish refers to a lack of wisdom. A fool is someone who lacks intelligence or experience, sometimes without even being aware of it. You know, sometimes we talk about, you know, there's an educated fool. They got all kinds of book smarts, but they just a fool and they don't even realize it. Mark 7 and 6 in the Message Bible states, These people make a big show of saying the right thing, but their heart isn't in it. They act like they are worshiping me, but they don't mean it. They just use me as a cover for teaching whatever suits their fancy, ditching God's command, and taking up the latest fads. Ecclesiastes 5 and 1 says, keep thy foot when thou goest to the house of God and be more ready to hear than to give the sacrifice of fools, for they consider not that they do evil. In Proverbs 18, 6 and 7 in the message says, the words of a fool start fights. Do him a favor and gag him. Like, do him a favor and just shut him up. Fools are undone by their big mouths. Their souls are crushed by their words. Realizing that their lamps cannot burn, the foolish bridesmaids panic and attempted to borrow some oil from the wise bridesmaids. But the wise bridesmaids responded, if we give you our oil, there's not going to be enough for us. It's better to have five torches burning, five lamps burning, than to have ten that can't burn at all. A well-soaked lamp would, you know, would burn for about 15 minutes. So it's kind of like the little tiki torches and stuff. And so they would burn for about 15 minutes, but they would have rags on there and stuff, and they would have to dip them in oil to soak. So these wise bridesmaids then tell the foolish virgins, go and go find some merchants, go and buy you some oil. So the foolish find themselves in want, and they go searching for oil. 
Now, how many of you know it's going to be very difficult to find oil at this late hour because it's at midnight? But they had no other choice. So, hey, go out. And though all of them were prepared by bringing their lamps, only five of them brought a vessel filled with oil. Now, the wise virgins were prepared because they had enough oil with them to get them through the night, unlike the foolish. Believers cannot share their oil with others. Each person must get it for themselves before it's too late. So you can't say, well, I'm going to borrow some. You know, Michelle can't say, I'm going to borrow from Minister Andrea because she got an extra reserve of oil. And that's going to help me. No, she can't do that. Luke 6, 46 through 49 and Amplified, the Lord said, Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I say? Everyone who comes to me and hears my words and acts on them, I will show you whom he is like. He is like a man building a house who dug deep and laid a foundation on the rock. And when a flood occurred, the torrent burst against that house and could not shake it because it had been well built. But the one who was heard and has not acted accordingly is like a man who built a house on the ground without any foundation. And the torrent burst against it and immediately it collapsed and the ruin of that house was great. Likewise, there are people who have built their religious house but have no foundation. If you and I are not willing to take the time and make the investment to build up our spiritual reserves while we have an opportunity, while we have the chance, a time may come when we find ourselves in a crisis situation in life. Like sickness may come upon you, death may happen, a loss of finances, a loss of job, or persecution may happen. And find that we do not have the spiritual reserves, we don't have enough oil to get through. The foolish have a just enough mentality. I'll come to church just enough to say I went. I'll pray just enough to have my needs met. They have no standard. This is the plight of many who prof professors of Christ. Many people that say, oh, I'm a Christian. All they're concerned about is looking good to those around them. They're concerned about what their friends think, what their neighbors think, what their family think, what church members think, the people they talk with. They're not concerned about proving themselves to Christ who they must appear before later. Many are falling away from the faith today, and by doing so, they reveal that they really were never in the faith. Now, don't take my word for it, but 1 John 2 and 19 in the Message Bible says, They left us, but they were never really with us. If they had been, they would have stuck it out with us, loyal to the end. In leaving, they showed their true colors, so they never did belong. Luke 8, 12 through 14, the message says, the seed is the word of God. The seeds on the road are those who hear the word, but no sooner do they hear it than the devil snatches it from them so they won't believe and be saved. The seeds in the gravel are those who hear with enthusiasm, but the enthusiasm doesn't go very deep. It's only another fad. And the moment there's trouble, it's gone. So the moment there's a little bit of trouble, it's gone. Mm -mm. I ain't going to do it. And the seed that fell in the weeds, well, these are the ones who hear, but when the seed is crowded out and nothing comes of it, as they go about their lives worrying about tomorrow, making money and having fun. And I like what Proverbs 24 and 10 says. It says, if you faint in the day of adversity, your strength is small. In a message Bible says it this way, if you fall to pieces in a crisis, there wasn't much to you in the first place. So every time there's a crisis situation, if you fall to pieces, there wasn't really much to you to begin with. The real test of our strength is not when things are going well, but how we react when things don't go well, when things don't go the way you expected them to go. In such times, we may look at those who made it through similar trials and say, I wish I had your faith. How did you get so much faith? Can't you give me some of your spiritual strength? And of course they can't. They can't give it to you. 
Faith and spiritual strength come only through day-by-day discipline. It comes through your own personal walk with the Lord. It comes through prayer. It comes through reading and studying and applying the word of God. Because we can't just be readers and we can't be hearers only, but we got to apply the word of God to our lives. It comes through personal preparation. We must prepare while there is still time. Paul wanted to get to business and start converting his Jewish brethren, but God had him spend 17 years in preparation before Paul went on his first missionary journey. Good pastors and teachers must go through times of studying and serving and preparing for ministry before God will use them. It took Moses 40 years to get his BD degree his backside of the desert degree. He had to go through some things in that backside of the desert before God called on him. Even Jesus spent 30 years in preparation before he began his three years of ministry. So come 30 years to prepare for only three years of ministry. So why is it that people think they don't have to go through anything and that they can just be used of God? You haven't been prepared. What are you currently doing to prepare spiritually? Whatever it is, consider taking it up a notch. Maybe, you know, you know, you maybe you say, oh, I memorize a scripture every week. Well, maybe consider memorizing an extra scripture a week. Maybe praying more, maybe studying longer, or perhaps starting a devotion. Maybe you're not doing a devotion, but maybe start a daily devotion. Then we see the participation. These foolish bridesmaids failed in preparing and procrastinated. And when the bridegroom came, they were out trying to find oil and was not something they could get at the spur of the moment. Spiritual reserves of oil are only built up over time. You can't wait to the last minute and think, oh, I can get this and stuff. No, it's, it's cultivated. It's something that has to be built up. By the time the foolish bridesmaids arrived, the door to the wedding feast had already been closed. We are not told whether or not they found oil. It doesn't tell us that. But I imagine they probably didn't find any oil at this late hour. But we don't know. But we do know that they missed the entire procession back to the house, back to the groom's house. But then they're knocking because they still want to participate. And so they knock on the door and they plead to be a part of the festivities. But the groom said, if you belong here, if you were supposed to be part of this event, you would have already been here. Sorry, I do not know you. What's that? I heard some people saying, you know, bye, Felicia. I don't know what that means. But they say, bye, Felicia. Like, I ain't opening the door for you. You don't belong here. It was custom in the east, and when all guests had arrived, that the doors were closed. They were closed to secure the marriage party and to exclude intruders. So there wasn't going to be any party crashes happening. Only those that were ready went in with the bridegroom. Having insulted the dignity of the host, they were not honored and admitted to the wedding feast, which was already in progress and lasted for seven days. It's like hiring musicians for your wedding reception, and they don't show up until halfway through the reception. But they still want to come in and set up and perform. Now, how many of you would let them in? Nobody? Not going to let them in? Okay. Likewise, when Christ comes, the door to heaven will be closed. Only the ready, the genuine guests will be secured in the joy of the great marriage feast. This was like the shutting of the door of the ark when Noah was in and he and his family were preserved. Those that thought he was crazy, those that rejected his cry, it's going to rain, were left out of the ark of safety and perished. And they probably looking in like, oh. They gone. It's really raining. Did you see that? They leaving. What's going to happen to us? The unprepared will find the door shut in order to exclude them. Jesus concluded. He says, watch therefore, for you, need, you know neither the day nor the hour. Our great duty is to watch. To watch means to stay awake and be alert. We must be ready every day and every hour. This is a parable about believers living during the tribulation. 
but it has application for us with the intent of teaching us the suddenness of the coming of the Lord. It is a call to preparedness so that we are not caught unprepared. The foolish bridesmaids came claiming to be part of the party when it was too little, too late. Many will seek Christ when it is too late and be rejected like Esau when he was told, I know you not. The importance of Christ knowing us is also stressed time and time again in Scripture. The way Christ gets to know us is by our participation in his journey, simply walking with him day by day. There's a poem entitled, If Jesus Came to Your House by Lois Blanchard Ease, which reads, If Jesus came to your house to spend a day or two, if he came unexpectedly, I wonder what you'd do. Oh, I know you'd give your nicest room to such an honored guest, and all the food you served to him would be the very best. And you would keep assuring him you're glad to have him here, but that serving him in your own home is joy beyond compare. But when you saw him coming, would you meet him at the door with arms outstretched and welcome to your heavenly visitor? Or would you have to change your clothes before you let him in or hide some magazines and put the Bible where they'd been? Would you turn off the radio and hope he hasn't heard and wish you hadn't uttered the last loud hasty word? Would you hide your worldly music and put some hymn books out? Could you let Jesus walk right in or would you rush about? And I wonder if the Savior spent a day or two with you, would you go right on doing the things you always do? Would you go right on saying the things you always say? Would life for you continue as it does from day to day? Would your family conversation keep up its usual pace? And would you find it hard each meal to say a table grace? Would you sing the songs you always sing and read the books you read and let him know the things on which your mind and spirit feed? Would you take Jesus with you everywhere you'd plan to go? Or would you maybe change your plans for just a day or so? Would you be glad to have him meet your very closest friends? Or would you hope they stay away until his visit ends? Would you be glad to have him stay forever on and on? Or would you sigh with great relief when he at last was gone? It might be interesting to know the things that you would do if Jesus Christ came in person to spend some time with you. Today is a day of search and inquiry. What would happen if the bridegroom were to come today? Would you become frantic like the foolish bridesmaids because you realize that you're not prepared? What would Christ find you doing? Would he find you studying, praying, reading his word? God knows every person's true character, and they will have to give an account for what they've done and for the choices that they've made. Some people believe that mom and dad can pray them into heaven or that they can get someone else to vouch for them. You know, Lord, I'm here. Uh, you know, um, my, my grandma in, is in there, my big mama. Uh, let them give you a word for me. I, I was good some of the time. Um, you know, my, my daddy in there, you know, he took me to church with him, you know, I, I, but I haven't gone in some time, but you know, but they can know when I was a little and I went, but it says so plainly buy for yourselves. Each person must obtain their own supply. Don't let it be too little, too late. 